Good evening, everyone. Thanks for attending our webinar tonight. We're going to let folks trickle in and start um, logging in here. We'll get started in just a few minutes. Thanks for being here. All right, got a great crowd here tonight. So I think we'll go ahead and get started. Uh, thanks everyone for joining us tonight. My name is Emily Misseldine. I'm energy management advisor here at La Plata Electric. Thanks so much for joining us for our third installation of our beneficial electrification webinar. Uh, tonight we're fo focusing on the latest in electric heating options. Um, big part of beneficial electrification is obviously we are heat space heating and something we're getting a lot of questions about and there's been a lot of um, evolution here in the last couple of years so we're really excited to talk to you guys more about all that tonight. Uh, I'd like to introduce our panelists. Uh, my colleagues Dennis McCarthy and John Kenny uh, will be speaking tonight about our electric heating options and LPAs rebates and programs available. Uh, we also have some familiar faces on the line uh, to answer some questions as well. Um, if you have questions as we go, please feel free to put them, enter them into the um, question and answer or the Q&A section there at the bottom, and we'll have plenty of time for questions at the end. Um, you can also feel free to raise your hand and we'll answer, but you'll have an opportunity to answer your question live um, at the end as well. So please, um, buckle up and thanks so much for being here, everyone. I'll go ahead and turn it over to John. Yeah, thanks, Emily. And thank you all for joining us tonight. Um, so we'll jump right into this. And, um, you know, as Emily said, this is kind of our third um, webinar here in our beneficial electrification um, series. So we'll, we'll kind of open it up talking a little bit about LPA and what BE actually is, so beneficial electrification. Um, so many of you know this already, but the L LPA is a co-op. So we're not a for-profit utility, um, investor-owned utility, um, as a couple others are here in Colorado. So what does that mean? Um, you know, one is that uh, you all as members of this co-op get to um, elect a, a board of directors here. So we have 12, board of, board of, uh, um, 12 people on the board of directors that do guide the, the, the motions of this co-op. Um, so it is important to get out there and, and vote on this. Um, so we're the... the fifth largest out of 22 co-ops throughout Colorado. Um, and as many of you know, and what's in the news lately, um, is that 95% of our power does come from Tri-State. Um, so some things kind of uh, moving around with that, but um, yeah, large portion of what we, what we take in power is from Tri-State, but 5% of that is um, kind of locally sourced here. So we do have a strategic goal here at LPEA, um, and that is that we wanna reduce our carbon footprint 50% from our 2018 levels um, by the year 2030, but we want to do it responsibly. We want to do it in a manner 
um, that also keeps costs low for you all as members. So we also have this, this adder here that we're going to keep our costs um, you know, below 7% of our co-op peers here in Colorado. Um, so doing the right thing, but also keeping costs um, you know, sustainable for you all. So what is beneficial electrification? Um, if you haven't heard of this term already, hopefully you'll hear more of it in the, in the near future. Um, and really what this is, is we're, we're trying to fuel switch. So we're trying to get away from gasoline and propane and natural gas, but we want to do it in a responsible manner. Um, you know, we want to do this so that um, you know, we're benefiting um, one of these three things here listed below without negatively affecting the others. So if we can make those fuel switches um, by you know, benefiting the environment, great. Um, we want to do that. But we also want to do that in a way that saves you all money in the long run um, and fosters a more robust and resilient grid. So if you have a technology that comes along and maybe isn't good for the grid or is going to cost you more in the long run, it's really not something that we want to, we want to stand behind and promote. Um, so what are we going to talk about here tonight? Um, just a quick overview of our agenda. So, uh, you know, we'll open it up and really just talk, talk at a high level about um, different types of electric heating. So we'll talk about baseboard, boiler and radiant systems, um, ETS or electrical thermal storage and heat pumps. Um, and one quick note here is that there, there are propane and natural gas options out there. Um, and they can be great kind of depending on where you are and what you're looking for. But we're gonna focus on electric heating here tonight. Um, you know, basically because we're an electric co-op. Um, we'll, go, we'll jump into a cost comparison here. So we'll kind of look at um, upfront costs, long-term costs. We'll also talk about um, LPA rebates that are available for a lot of these technologies. And then the, just a quick mention on the tax incentives that are available to help out to, to pay for some of these as well. And then we'll get into how to actually start off purchasing a new system like, like this. Um, so with that, I'm going I'm to hand it over to uh, Dennis McCarthy. He's going to open it up for us, um, talking a little bit about uh, baseboard heating. Yeah, thank you, John. Uh, yeah, so I'm going to start off with uh, just baseboard heating. If you can go, you're on that slide there. Um, so basically, this is something that has been around, you know, everybody's probably really familiar with just the, you know, the baseboards. Um, originally, 70s, 80s, you know, they were installed. Um, I don't think we really see them too often, you know, in new construction these days. Um, but they come in all shapes and sizes, uh, square shapes, long shapes, you know, eight foot, six foot, two foot. Um, they're all sized basically off of like square footage of the home. Um, so basically all they are is uh, a resistive uh, heat. So it has a conductive material and you're running electricity through it and creating heat. Um, but with using that, uh, you know, they can be somewhat costly these days. So um, operating them, uh, you know, you want to be starting, you know, wanna, you want to start looking at, um, you know, programmable thermostats and maybe some uh, rate options like our time of use, uh, things like that. So, um, and timers and things like that. So, uh, you know, they do work, they do the job, um, but, you know, moving on to the next slide. Thank you. Um, you know, I'm going to talk about, you know, electric boilers and radiant systems here just a little bit. Um, so radiant heat, um, you may be familiar with, uh, you know, there it's, it's kind of a, a wire loop um, in-floor mat lay. So they come in a mat, they have the wiring ran in it and basically either poured into a slab or under a wood floor. Um, some familiar names with those systems would be, uh, you know, new heat or like warmly yours or heat wave, you'll, you'll see if you look it up, um, they come in 120 volt or 240 volt options. Um, most of them come with a programmable thermostat as well. So you can program them to run when you want them to run. Um, moving on to, you know, uh, the electric boiler kind of setup. So we're talking more of like a hydronic type system. So very familiar, like warm floor hydronic uh, tubing um, that's poured in the concrete. So there's a couple different options available. Um, uh, you know, traditionally you would probably see something like this, um, like a gas boiler set up, but they have electric options as well, um, where you just have a, you know, basically a, a you know, electric element, um, kind of like a water heater, but electric element, it heats, um, 
when you tell it to heat, basically controllability, um, you can have multiple zones um, and it's just running, you know, with a typical circulating pump um, and then going to every zone. Um, a lot of the systems here in Durango, you'll see like buffer tanks that will hold uh, the hot water basically um, for storage. So they can be used uh, basically for domestic hot water. So there's also systems that are just water heaters heating the water going through a circulating pump into a slab. So that was uh, somewhat popular in this area, um, maybe through the 90s, early 2000s. But, um, you know, another setup is uh, ETS. Um, you, you know, they have ETS uh, and heat pump options for the boilers. But moving into the ETS, um, this has been pretty popular uh, in this area or this region for quite a while. Um, they're available in room units, which is pictured right here. Um, they also have like central air ducted versions, um, also hydronic in-floor versions. So um, they're very basic, actually. They're just a thermal brick mass that will hold heat. Um, in the picture, you can see um, several elements um, that will heat. Um, and what they use is a controller um, through our basic time of use rate, which I'll get into, um, to have this thing heat at certain times of the day when it's the cheap electricity basically to use to heat that. Um, but if you look at this image here, it's kind of just the kind of skeleton view of it. Um, they have fan, uh, blower, and uh, basic controls. Just This is just a typical room unit. Um, so, uh, these, you know, they're, they're minimal maintenance. Um, they can operate about 20 plus years, um, clean, safe, reliable. They don't emit any harmful chemicals or anything out into your home and you have heat going 24 hours a day. Um, the next slide and I'll, I'll get into like the, the time of use rate. So, um, or this rate class, basically. So this is, we're talking about residential uh, rate. So there's all sorts of rates that we have. Um, this would be, I'm gonna start at the top here. And we, most of you are probably familiar with the standard rate. So we're talking uh, 12 cents a kilowatt hour. Um, there is a demand rate that's built into it between four and 9 p.m. And this is just charging $1.50 for the highest hour used um, per month. So usually it's very minimal, but the time of use rate is another option. And a lot of people use this um, working with, uh, you know, the, the home heating products that, that are around the electric, you know, products, but basically time of use, uh, it's broke up where 16 hours of the day um, is off peak. Um, so that would be six cents a kilowatt hour. Um, so a lot of times you would say off peak, uh, there's some different across the country, there's different names for off peak on and off peak. They call it off peak power or watt saver um, was what it was called for a while. Um, so there are spots that are on peak um, usually, and you can kind of see the, the graph here between six and 9 a.m. That would be on peak. And then again at five to 10 would be on peak again. Well, it's 25 cents a kilowatt hour pretty much. So we don't have, you know, you, you're not gonna have your heating equipment charging that time of the day. Um, so if this is something that, you know, you're interested in, um, you can get hold, a hold of one of us uh, here at La Plata Electric basically and do a rate comparison. Um, and we can actually pick out different times of the, uh, the month um, or the year, summer, winter, and basically plug these, plug this formula in and it can tell you if you save money. I normally see 99% of the people or members that I talk with, they would save money on the time use rate. Um, right now we have a little over 4,000 members on the time use rate. So it's definitely something pretty beneficial. So um, moving on to the next slide, please. All right. So ETS, so, so controls. So we talk about controllability. There's some other options out there, timers, um, control, you know, thermostats and things. Um, this device uh, is what they 
what they say, like a, they, they call it a PLC connect or the newer term would be Stephis connect. So this device will restrict your heating um, devices or equipment um, to charge uh, off peak. So um, it also has some visibility, which is really neat. So, you know, you can control your consumption. Um, you have visibility and remote control. That means that you basically um, can do setbacks. So if you travel, you can set it back. You can press a button on your phone and it will um, come back up to temperature uh, and be nice and warm when you get there, when you get back to Durango. But uh, also it has some weather forecasting. Um, and then it, it'll tell you, you know, your indoor temperature. It'll tell you your outdoor temperature. And it'll send you some alerts too. So if something went wrong in your house and the temperature dropped down to, let's say 45 degrees, it would say, uh oh, you know, we have a problem. We need to uh, address it or get somebody on the phone to, to work with it. So um, pretty neat technology. It's always changing. And, and uh, you know, if, if you want to learn more, just try to get a hold of us and we can, we can definitely walk you through it some more. So I'm going to hand it off to John and um, we'll talk, we'll start working towards uh, the heat pump options, which are pretty neat, so. Yeah, so we'll jump right into it. So, so heat pumps, and so basically how do they work? Well, what we, what we have here is um, what a lot of people are familiar with is an air conditioning system that works in reverse. So that, that top left picture there shows that outside condenser, which kind of works in both directions. And then you have an indoor unit. Um, so something that you're familiar with, but in this case, we can actually run it in reverse and get heating out of this as well. Um, so we'll, we'll talk a little bit of science here real quick, and then we'll jump into kind of form factor stuff. But in the, the bottom right photo here, um, we've got kind of an overview of a heat pump system. So if we start in the bottom left there, where you see that, that blue pipe kind of looping around to the left and up, what that is, is a, a refrigerant line. So you actually have a, a very cold liquid refrigerant inside there. And it's going to pass it through the coils in that outside unit. A uh, fan is going to blow air through there. And what that's actually doing is taking that ambient air, even, even down in that negative 15, negative uh, 20 degree Fahrenheit temperature that we see in the, in the winter, it's just stealing little bits of heat out of the air and passing it into that refrigerant. And it does that enough that once it passes through that coil, it's now actually a vapor. And it's going to move through that, uh, through that pipe towards the inside of that compressor that you see there in the middle. And that's actually going to compress the, the refrigerant that's in there, um, increase its pressure and really increase its temperature. And then that, that warm uh, vapor refrigerant is now going to get passed inside the home into this indoor unit that you see there. We've got another set of coils inside that uh, indoor unit with a fan in behind them. And really what that's doing is taking the heat and blowing it into your, into your home. And it does that enough now that once that, that uh, refrigerant leaves that indoor unit, it's now back to a, to a liquid. So it's cooled down uh, enough. And now it's gonna enter this expansion chamber where it's gonna cool even more. It's gonna expand and it's gonna release some pressure. And now we're kind of back to the, to the start where we were at a very cold uh, uh, liquid refrigerant here. And the cool thing is that we have this little reversing valve on this that can make that, that whole process work in reverse. So now we're actually taking heat from the home and passing it to the outside. And that's how we get cooling out of this as well. Um, so kind of a neat system. It's been around for a long time, but the technology is really kind of um, coming to maturity here in the last probably few years, but honestly, it's a, to where it's working um, kind of in our environment. Um, so a lot of science there, a lot of parts to that, but really what are you concerned with as a, as a homeowner? Really only two components that you're ever gonna see on this. One is gonna be this outdoor unit. The other we'll take a look at next is a indoor unit. Um, so we've got two different types here. One is uh, on the left here, air source heat pump. So like we mentioned, it's actually taking heat from the air going through that coil. But we also have this ground source heat pump. Um, so, you know, another technology that's been around for, for a long time. And it turns out that really you don't have to go too far down into the earth um, before it maintains a temperature of about 50 or 60 degrees year round. And what we can do is put a refrigerant line into the, into the ground um, in a loop like you see right there. And now we can get heat out of the ground or we can pass heat into the ground um, and be able to, to work that same heat pump system off of that. Um, higher expense on the ground source, just because you have to do some trenching and there's more material and labor to it. So we do see a lot more air source heat pumps out there. 
um, but both great options as we'll, as we'll see coming up here. So the indoor unit, um, so it comes in a lot of different form factors. Um, one thing to note here is that in a lot of systems, you're gonna have one outdoor unit um, connected to several indoor units potentially. So you'll hear it called zones. So you might have a two or three zone system where you have one outdoor unit connected to kind of three heads on the inside. Um, so how do these all kind of come together on the, on the indoor portion? Um, so for those of you that have a, a furnace or central AC, on the left-hand side here, we actually have a central air handler. So we'd swap this out for what you have existing. And now you can get both heating and cooling out of that same air handler. Um, the next one over, so a mini split or ductless system is probably one of the most popular. Um, if you haven't heard about it yet, it's, it's, it's coming and it's going to be here um, kind of in a big way. And um, really simple system that is kind of low cost um, to install. And in this picture, you can see you have an outdoor unit just connected by those refrigerant lines that we talked to. About a four inch hole passes through your wall into an indoor air handler. And now your indoor air is basically just cycling through that air handler to either be heated or cooled. Um, and again, one outdoor unit can be connected to multiple indoor units. The next one over, compact ductless or a distributed system. In this case, we would have one indoor air handler up in a crawl space or an attic or a ceiling and then you have these little mini short little duct runs going into our, our different zones. So in this case, a couple of different bedrooms and a, a main living space. Um, so we get minimal heat loss or cooling loss through those duct runs, um, but we're able to use one indoor air handler to really control kind of four different zones out there. And then for those of you who have in-floor heat, you know, Dennis touched on it before, but there are heat pump options available um, for these hydronic systems. You know, if you have a boiler, um, anything like that, um, we can now put a heat pump on that. And um, you, know, you can even uh, do that as a supplement for an existing propane system or a gas system if you wanted to. Um, but we just have a boiler that most of the time is going to run off that heat pump. If it gets too cold and the heat pump can't carry the load, it can then shift over to some of these, some of these other technologies. So that's our indoor units. Um, so what options do you have for actually replacing these? You know, it doesn't necessarily have to be just a complete replacement. Um, so the first thing you know, we'll talk about is, yeah, it's just a full swap out. Maybe you get rid of your furnace and you put in some mini splits or you put in a, a central air handler. Um, maybe you tear out your baseboard and now you've got some, some multi-zone uh, uh, mini splits going in um, or do something like a distributed system. But we can also do it as a, a supplement. So you can have your, your existing um, gas furnace and then have a heat pump um, air handler sitting right next to it. And now you've brought on both the, the high efficiency of that, that heat pump, but also cooling in the same space without having to get rid of that existing system. Um, so another great way to do it. And then zonal. So let's say you have a couple back bedrooms or um, an office or something like that, that you really want to, you know, heat better than maybe the, the furnace is carrying, or you want just cooling back there. Now you can add some, some heat pump options um, on top of the up top of the existing heating or cooling system, and they can just work together. You, know, you can have a single control system or multiple control systems that that will just um, pick up and, uh, off of each other. Um, so you don't have to exactly get rid of everything you have there. You can bring a heat pump on, um, you know, as a supplemental or a zonal option there. So some heat pump benefits and myths. Um, so first of all, the benefits, you know, the, the kind of elephant in the room here is that propane is cheap. So, you know, people are thinking, well, why would I want to go with a, with a heat pump if it's going to cost me more? Um, one is that it's improved air quality and safety. Um, you know, you don't have uh, you know, carbon monoxide and some of these other noxious gases coming off of a, um, a heat pump system, a electric system like you would with uh, potentially propane or natural gas. And you also get cooling out of it. Um, so, you know, some extra benefits there that uh, a lot of people are taking into consideration here and looking towards the future as well, um, seeing, you know, natural gas prices increase. So some of the myths that we hear on heat pumps, um, so heat pumps are not efficient in cold temperatures. So what you'll see is something called a cold climate air source heat pump. Um, there's a couple lists out there, a couple organizations who are doing kind of certifications and requirements around this. But what that's basically saying is that it's, it's rated highly enough, the efficiency is high enough that it'll work in our, in our temperatures. So it'll work at our altitude, it'll work in our temperatures, in this dry air, um, if it's designed correctly and it's rated um, kind of highly. So the other one we hear is heat pumps need backup. So you'll have a lot of people that'll, that'll have a propane 
um, or natural gas backup or even electric resistive uh, coils on a backup. And what we're finding is that if that system is properly designed, that we really don't need backup on it, um, even down in those very, very cold temperatures there. You know, and, and people also say, well, what if the power goes out? If the power goes out, your, your propane or natural gas system is going down as well. It has a blower in it. Um, so, you know, that it's going to be in kind of the, the same ballpark there is that, that heat pump. So heat pumps don't work at our altitude. Um, you know, we've seen a, a lot of different um, installations across our territory. And then if you head north into even Holy Cross, um, they've got installations up at 6,000, 8,000 feet that are working just fine at that, that altitude and in that thin air. Um, so altitude is not a concern for a, a you know, a well-designed system here. Um, the other one we hear is heat pumps only work in newer homes. You know, it's well insulated, it's sealed. Um, you know, you can't have a leaky older home. And while we would advocate for going after things like insulation and sealing, you know, some weatherization, um, if that system is properly designed, it'll carry the heating load for that for that home, kind of no matter what's going on in there. Um, the other one we hear is that heat pumps need to be turned down at night to save energy. And really the old adage is that, you know, you, if you go away from home or if you're going to leave for a long time, if you're out at work for the day, you know, you turn that thing down by eight to 10 degrees to try and save a little bit of money. But with heat pumps, what we're finding is that they're actually better if you just leave the temperature around the same um, set point just for the entire day and night. You know, so you might drop it down by a, by a couple degrees, three degrees. But really what we want that, that heat pump to do is just kind of cruise along and not have to race up and down to try and catch up with, um, with you know, heating requirements. If we drop it by 10 degrees and then tell it to instantly go back up. And then the last one is that heat pumps require a lot of maintenance. Um, and really what we're seeing is that a heat pump doesn't require much more maintenance than, um, than an AC system. You know, so you have to you have a filter, a reusable filter on the indoor unit that just needs to get rinsed off every once in a while. And then we always advocate for every couple of years just have a, a tech come out to test out some refrigerant lines, um, wash off some coils, things like that, and just make sure everything's uh, working properly there. So that's kind of it for the, the heat pump side of things. We'll come back to talk about um, costs and things like that a little bit, but I'll, I'll turn it over here um, to, back to Dennis, and he's gonna talk our, our cost comparison and uh, rebates as well. Thanks, John. Um, so yeah, you know, basically the big question is what does this stuff cost to, to do an install or, um, a lot of times we're looking at maybe a retrofit, um, you know, uh, gas, natural gas, propane, um, you know, they have a longevity of, let's say, 10 to 15 years. If you have somebody that's going to come and try to do some maintenance on a piece of equipment, if it's over 15 years, a lot of times they won't even look at it. Um, so it's really interesting. So just starting at the top here, um, let's talk about heat pumps. Um, so. All of these figures, uh, these are generated basically from uh, LPA members. So uh, from rebates that we see, um, the size units uh, you know, that are going in. Um, so we're kind of generating a graph here showing what the cost is, what the rebate is, and then what the yearly cost is. So the yearly cost would be you know, standalone, just the heating, um, operating by itself, not the rest of the home lights and all the other things going on. So heat pump, you're looking at, you know, let's say $12,780. That's going to be, you know, the equipment and the installation. Um, that's actually like an average was, uh, was a 2.8, uh, or I'm sorry, a little over almost a three ton unit, let's say, um, that'd be a typical 2000 square foot home. Um, you're going to have about, you know, $1,420 of rebates coming back through LPA, you know, towards that. Um, and then a yearly cost of about five, 566 52. So, um, looking at, you know, the electric thermal storage, um, or ETS. So, uh, again, 2000 square foot home, um, We've got the rates kind of built into this. So we're, we're thinking off peak right now, um, heating, um, maybe two units, maybe a furnace. Um, we're looking at $7,000. So uh, you, you'd be looking at about $420 coming back at you for, for rebates, you know, through, through a plot electric. And then a yearly heating cost of, you know, a little over $800. So $838.96, let's say. So we're a little bit above you know, the heat pump. 
And then we get to, you know, the electric baseboard. Um, you know, it's, it's obviously upfront costs are, are very cheap to install. Um, uh, and, you know, so you're looking at, let's say a whole home, you know, $5,000. Um, we don't have any rebates available for the resistive heating. Um, but you're looking at the operation cost of it jumping way up to about $1,700. So, you know, you're getting kind of caught on the other side for operating it. Um, and then we'll just touch, you know, propane, um, you know, let's just say a standard propane furnace. Uh, you know, you're looking at about a $10,000 install there. And, you know, you're looking at about $1,200, $1,300 about to operate that um, for the year. Um, and then natural gas, you know, same kind of concept, obviously natural gas furnace, about $10,000, but, you know, operating costs are, are way down right now. Um, you know, the thing with this is if you look at this operating cost for the propane and natural gas, um, you know, the propane will, will fluctuate throughout the year. So if you're familiar with, if you have propane, which most members here live out in the county on propane, let's say, you know, you may get it in, locked in at like $1.90 you may end up paying three fifty four dollars a gallon when you really need it. Um, if you fill up, you know, your tank a couple hundred gallons at a time or something like that, where obviously, you know, the natural gas, um, we just saw, you know, um, in the Herald, you know, obviously the, the prices are rising. So um, with the other rates, with the electricity, that's the good thing about it is, you know, we, it doesn't fluctuate like that. And there's a lot of effort that goes into keeping the rates low. Um, and there's a lot of, you know, room, you know, ahead of time, knowing if something's going to adjust. So um, next slide, please. And we'll, we'll talk about, uh, talk about some rebates here. So um, I'm going to touch, La Plata Electric has a ton of rebates. Um, basically, anything that's involved with BE or, um, you know, just uh, electric power tools and things like that, but focusing on the heating uh, equipment, breaking it down for, let's say, heat pumps. Um, so we've got some pretty hefty rebates for heat pumps. So, um, you know, the type of, uh, you know, heat pump, we're looking at like air source, um, then we have ground source, and we have air to water. So let's start with air source. Um, we've got some minimal, you know, requirements. Um, the, the SEER rating is a big number if you've looked at these. So if you're looking at 15, 17, you're looking at about $350 a, a ton back. Um, so a ton being 12,000 BTUs. Um, looking at most of the ones, the cold climate heat pumps that are going in here, or pretty much all of them that are going in these days are 17 plus. So you have the one ton minimum, um, but you're looking at $500 a ton coming back at you. Um, and you can shave that off the top of the, you know, for the cost of the equipment. Sometimes it could pay for pretty much half of the equipment costs. So it's pretty neat. Um, you know, there's some other, you know, ETS backup and, you know, through wall units and things like that. But, you know, you have ground source, um, you know, you have some minimums there, three quarter ton, um, $550 a ton. We don't see too many of those just because, you know, it is uh, costly to do the installation. Um, and then let me just jump down to air, air to water. Um, uh, basically, it's 450 a ton. Um, so, if you have any questions on that, obviously get a hold of us and we can walk you through it. Um, a lot of the contractors are very aware of all this and they can walk you through it as well. But um, the ETS, or you know, so it's permanent electric heating um, sources, is kind of how we put it. But ETS is is a basic straight up thirty dollars a kW. So they're sized by kW. A typical size would be like five point four or you know, a larger room unit would be 10.8. Um, so you can be looking at, you know, $350 coming back at you. Um, if, if you have any sort of um, in slab, uh, you know, where we're talking about the boilers, um, that would be considered uh, thermal slab heating, $30 a KW on that. Then any sort of um, control that you're putting in, if you're replacing your old thermostats um, with, you know, the newer smart thermostats, um, nest thermostats, things like that, any of the controllability, the um, uh, Stephens Connect devices, uh, $25 uh, per timer. Um, and, uh, you know, all of this is up to 50, you know, 50% of the material cost as well. So 
um, it definitely helps out and we have a lot of people really taking advantage of it. So it's, it's pretty exciting to see um, just helping people get this stuff put in. Um, so I'm going to kick it back over to John and just kind of go through some stuff on how to get started. So I think you're on mute, John. Sorry, yeah, so, so talk a little bit about steps of how to get started here. But first and foremost, if, if you ever have any questions, if you're just concerned about, um, you know, what system to go with, anything like that, um, we do have a team of four energy management advisors here at LPA. So, you know, please give us a call, reach out, and we're happy to talk through anything with you. So the first steps that we always kind of advocate for is really addressing energy efficiency first. Um, so the reason we want to do this is that if we can take that heating load down inside that home, um, that potentially that, that investment in that system is going to be decreased. You know, we can undersize that system a little bit um, and you're going to save more in the long run because you've addressed energy efficiency. And now that system's not trying to, to work so hard. So how do we do this? Um, so a little bit of uh, building envelope work. So that's insulation and sealant work. So going after windows, doors, um, any of the penetrations where um, you know wire and, and um, pipe come through your walls, things like that. Um, you can see that you've got heat escaping into an attic here through light fixtures and hatches and things like that. Um, we also want to try and limit heat generating plug loads. That's you know things that we leave plugged in all the time and on, like TVs and. Uh, um, and phone chargers and all this other equipment that's just drawing little bits of power all the time, along with things like lighting. You know, if we can put LED lighting and, and some of these other um, higher efficiency uh, pieces of equipment in, then we can take some of the heating load off there if you're trying to cool that space down. And then also using things like passive solar. So opening those windows on the sunny side of the, the home during the, during the winter, and then also closing the blinds on the sunny side during, during the summer. Um, you'd be surprised at how much heat you can get into a home just through the sun um, and vice versa. In the summer, if you leave the, those, those curtains open, you're really going to heat that home up really fast. So working with a contractor. So this is kind of, um, you know, step two. Step one being, you know, reach out to us, talk through it. Um, you know, if you're comfortable, you know what you're, you're going after then, um, you know, get out and talk to a contractor, um, you know, with an electric boiler or baseboard. You can get in touch with a HVAC contractor um, or a plumber and electrician if that's the, the team that you're going to need there. We'll typically do a system sizing and installation. And once that's all complete, you know, talk to us. Let's let's get you a rebate on any things that we can, like um, like Dennis talked about on the timer. With ETS, um, we've had some changes to the program here in the last year. Um, typically, this was sold out of house here at LPA, um, but we kind of made a strategic shift um, now to have Durango Electric be the the Stephis um, distributor for the area. So um, parts uh, come from Durango Electric now, but you're always welcome to work with um, your favorite electrician, or you can reach out to, to us or directly to Durango Electric, um, who is doing installs in the area out here as well. Um, that systems, uh, that process is really similar here in that we're gonna do a system sizing, we're gonna do the installation, but then we've got a little bit extra work to get that PLC, that power line carrier, the controller that Dennis mentioned up and running. And then we'll also want to make sure we get you shifted over to our time of use rate class so you can take advantage of those, those low rates um, for off-peak heating there and then get your rebate as well. So we want to make sure that you, you file for a rebate. On the heat pump side of things, uh, definitely going to want to talk to an HVAC contractor on this, um, someone who's qualified. And what we've started up here is this quality install program. So we've got a, a number of uh, area contractors who have gone through a short training um, just to make sure that uh, kind of everyone's on the same page as far as how these systems are being designed so that in the end, it's going to be something that works for you. Um, it's not going to be undersized, oversized, anything like that. That process um, involves uh, something called a manual J, which is just a, a fancy term for another system sizing, but it goes into greater depth to really explore the home and make sure we're capturing all of the um, kind of details of, of sizing that system out correctly. You'll talk with that contractor about uh, you know, what kind of system you actually want, what kind of zones you want, what kind of capabilities you want out of that system um, to kind of hone in on what exactly is gonna be installed. They'll complete that installation and then you're off um, back to the rebate. You know, get in touch with us and let's, um, let's get you some money back on that, on that purchase as well. So that's kind of um, gonna conclude our, our presentation here, but I'm gonna leave you with a, a few resources here first and foremost. So, Again, I mentioned our, our, our energy management team here. Um, we do have a, a, a um, 
kind of collective re, uh, email here at rebates at lpa.coop. So if you ever have any questions or you're submitting a rebate, it's a great place to go. You can always call into to LPA here and just request to talk to an energy management advisor. Um, and then uh, also our website has a lot of great info on there. You'll see a lot of changes coming up here in the near future as we as we start to put more info up there, more resources. Um, but that's that's always there for you as well. And then two uh, kind of third party websites that I'll um, kind of mention here as well. One is loveelectric.org. Ton of great information on there. Whether you're looking for heating options, um, you know, water heating, electric vehicles, uh, induction cooktops, anything beneficial electrification, they've got a ton of great info up there and cost comparisons and all these other things. And then uh, the NEEP, that's the Northeast Energy Efficiency Partnership. Um, a lot of info on there, but one thing I'll mention that they do have is a list of coal climate air source heat pumps. So they've got their own criteria uh, created there. So if you're wondering whether your heat pump is going to work out here in our environment, um, you know, jump on their website and see if they've got it listed on their on their um, um, coal climate air source heat pump list, and uh, that'll set you right in the, in the right direction. So with that, um, I'll turn it back over to Emily, and I think we'll we'll take some some questions here. Thank you so much, John and Dennis. A lot of great information in there. Um, I'm going to go ahead and open it up to questions. We do have a couple here in the chat. Um, feel free to type them into the Q&A section below, um, or at this point, if you'd like to raise your hand, um, I'll call on you and, and let you um, open it up for you to talk. So we'd love to hear from you guys and any questions you guys have. Um, thank you guys so much for being here. Um, I have a first question in the chat. Um, I have a two-story brick home built in 1898. I do have a crawl space above the second floor and a crawl space basement. What would you recommend? Dennis, I can give the first part. Um, 1898 is an older home. Let, let's work on insulation and infiltration first. Make sure that thing is sealed up um, so we can potentially downsize that system. Um, and then crawl spaces, it, really it's gonna depend on a couple things. One is aesthetics. So, are you all right with something like a mini split? Um, do you want central air? Um, you know, do you want the distributed system that's gonna be a little bit more hidden away? So the form factor is a big one. And then it's just a, a matter of um, having a contractor size that system out so that it's gonna work for that home and making sure that they're taking into consideration the fact that it's an older home, that maybe the insulation and um, infiltration values aren't, aren't all that high. Um, so yeah, it'll, it'll work out for you great. But uh, yeah, I'd, I'd say let's engage a contractor and start talking about what form factor you wanna, wanna put in there and what's gonna work best for that home, keep that cost low. And um, yeah, I think I think it'd be be off off to the races there in the right direction. Dennis, I don't know if you have anything yeah. to, to add on that. Yeah, I, I would just add, you know, like, you know, what is, uh, what do you have existing for, for heating in the home? Uh, basically, if it's like a, some sort of boiler system, um, you, you know, obviously being that age, 1898, um, you know, it could be pretty primitive. Um, I would almost say, you know, you may have some baseboard heat possibly already, you know, already installed. If that was the case, you know, the ETS kind of is an easy retrofit there. Um, if you have an existing boiler, um, then you may be looking at, you know, retrofitting with one of these, uh, you know, heat pump boiler options uh, or, you know, possibly, you know, the standalone uh, mini splits, you know, one or two of those. So there's, there's a lot of different options. And like John said, it's really the aesthetics that, that please you and what you want to see. So, um, but I would say, please reach out to us and, and let us, you know, start working towards, you know, getting you, uh, getting you set up. And, um, you know, there's a lot of really good um, uh, energy, um, you know, audits that can be done too. So we have some rebates towards that as well. So you can have, you know, we can kind of do some basics, but you can have a, a professional come in and they will go through everything um, and, and make sure, you know, and, and kind of point you in the right direction. Then you can kind of get a rebate on top of that as well. So. Awesome. Thanks guys. Um, Steve Riddell, I've got you ready to go ahead and talk. You should be able to unmute yourself and right. go ahead and answer your question. Thank you. This is for John. John, you talked about ductless distributed systems. Um, <clears throat> I didn't see you talked about duct distributed systems and wondered 
if those were also available or under what conditions they might get used, we're going to be building a new home next year, a 1,700 square foot um, single level home on a four foot crawl. And so we're kind of trying to decide, we're, we're trying to decide what kind of a heat pump system we need to put in. Uh, I, you know, from what you read on the internet, they still talk about needing to have backup systems. I, I haven't, I've just recently learned about cold climate um, uh, heat pumps. <clears throat> and uh, the other thing that I've heard about is um, that you need a, because you, because you have to have a tight envelope for uh, these to be very, to be used and to be efficient uh, for heating and cooling, uh, you need to have an air exchanger. So how does all, all that kind of come into deciding if you want a ductless distributed or a duct distributed system? Yeah, so, so the ducted system is going to be kind of your central air handler. The downside to that is, you know, you, you can insulate those and seal those all you want, but there is going to be some heating and cooling loss within the, within the ducts. It's also going to be typically a higher expense to run that duct work through the home. And that's kind of where the, the distributed systems come in it's because those duct runs are really short. They're well insulated. They're sized properly. Um, and so that, that gets you into the, into the zones that you need to, um, as far as the ventilation goes. Yeah. If you're building a newer home, newer homes are, are really well sealed, really well insulated. And yeah, you do want to do, um, like a heat recovery ventilator or, um, or makeup air on something like that so that we've got proper ventilation going through there. Um, if you do not put that in, you probably will run into health problems. That, that is how tightly sealed some of these homes are. Um, and then, uh, you know, to address the, the, the question of, um, of backup heating there, again, we're seeing these systems going in without backup. Um, you know, for a power outage, you know, obviously let's, let's talk about, you know, generators or having, a, you know, just a, um, a fire, uh, a wood stove on site there. If you really want to have backup going there. But yeah, if, if something's properly designed on this, cold climate air source heat pumps will work in this environment without, without having to bring a backup in there. Um, you know, do be aware that most systems are going to have a defrost cycle on them. So they do have a resistive heating built into the built into the system, but it's not really meant to be a, a backup on there. Um, and then, uh, um, yeah. And as far as, uh, you know, working in some of these older leaky homes, it really just means that the system is going to be larger and it's going to have to work harder, but yeah, we do need to address insulation infiltration before we want to bring a heat pump into something like this. Thank you. Great. Thanks so much. Um, I, I have one I can answer real quick. Um, will this presentation be available on your website? Um, all registered attendees will receive a copy of the, uh, the slides from today, as well as a recording on the webinar. Um, if there's interest in needing, having us posted on the website, I think it can um, chat with our comms team about doing that as well. Um, but all attendees will get a copy of the recording and the slides. Thanks for coming. Um, do you have a list of qualified HVAC contractors for heat pumps? Yeah, I can uh, take this one. Uh, we definitely do. Uh, so we have a qualified uh, contractor installer program basically and uh they've gone through some training um and uh basically we would i don't know if we have it on our website yet but if you reach out to us um you can see this last slide here um, <clears throat> call or reach out to john or or myself um and i believe we have about 10 or so on there so they can run down and um come do a manual J kind of figure out what, what size unit, um, and you know, what, what, what you'd be looking at basically. So. And if, if you're a contractor on this call and you're interested, um, you know, please call us as well. It's a short three hour training and, um, yeah, we'll get you on the list and get you, get you some additional um, incentives as well. Great. Thanks guys. Um, could we charge an ETS unit with our solar panel system? Yeah, you, you sure can. Um, so we have a lot of uh, ETS out there um, that we, we call net metered um, customers. Um, so there's a lot of possibilities there. Um, we have some members that will do some uh, 
you know, some scheduling where they take advantage of all of that sunlight, you know, earlier on and all the way till, you know, it, it, till it gets dark. But um, it's always good to like check in and kind of see what's going on. We've got some really talented people here that can go over a lot of different rate structures. Um, not necessarily, you know, maybe the time of use may not be the best option. You know, you may be looking at, you know, maybe the general rate. So there's a lot of different options there, but the, the answer to that question is definitely yes. Thanks, Dennis. Yep. Um, got a couple of folks with specific uh, circumstance questions that is really helpful to get a sense of what's going on. So I'll get to both of these. We have about 10 more minutes for questions. Um, we have, we own a 2,500 square foot true adobe home, a 14 inch wall thickness, five zone hydronic in-floor heat with a 20 year old propane boiler, considering a conversion to either a high efficiency propane boiler or a high efficiency electric boiler. Prop annual propane costs are about $2,000 a year. What would be your recommendation? Yeah, that's I'll jump on this yeah. one. So the um, so the limitation on a heat pump system is going to be somewhere around 120 to 130 degrees Fahrenheit. So if you have an existing system that was designed within those parameters, so it's using around 120 um, Fahrenheit, then we can make it work. If you have a system where the, the loops are a little wider, it was designed to something like 160. Um, then we're going to need something of a backup. Um, there are some systems out there um, like Electro that we've just we've just looked at um, that has an electronic kind of booster on that. It'll switch back and forth between heat pump um, and the, the electric option. And then you also have ones that'll actually switch over from the heat pump over back over to something like propane or whatever you have existing. Um, so there are options out there. Um, you can certainly make it work with a heat pump, but it's, um, yeah, it's definitely going to be engage a contractor so they can see what you have existing and whether it's going to work out with a, with a heat pump there and whether we need to kind of put a, put something of a booster on top, on top of that system. Um, Dennis, I don't know if you have any other, anything else to add on that one? Yeah. You know, I, I would say definitely, you, you know, obviously the, the electro, um, you know, obviously it's got a, a heat pump kind of a, uh, sits outside and then it's switching back and forth between that um, electric element. Um, so that's something that I would kind of look into, um, you know, you know, for that setup. Uh, they do have some other um, straight up electric options that have come online. Um, a company called Argo is another one and they've got some standalone straight up. Um, you know, I, I just be kind of aware, you know, of the cost, you know, what that's going to cost to keep those elements on and heating that water. Um, so, but I, again, I would definitely reach out <clears throat> to us and start, you know, kind of go over some things and talk to some contractors. Definitely. Yeah. We're learning about new products and, uh, new available options all the time. These cold climate heat pump options have really been developing a lot over the last few years. So I would just generally throw out there to recommend to echo these guys that, um, you know, please reach out to us directly. Dennis and John are really great resources. They're talking to contractors all the time um, and their, their contact info is up on the screen right now. Um, so before you make any choices or, or pull any triggers, I would recommend reaching out to LPA. We're a resource and we're always here to help. Um, just to follow up on the qualified contractor program, do you have a list of qualified HVAC contractors in Pagosa Springs? We do, yeah. So we can connect you with uh, with Pagosa based contractors as well, and um, yeah, we'd love to have them on the, the QI quality install program as well. So if you're in Pagosa, we can certainly recommend us run a, a couple out there. Um, we are building a 1,500 square foot shop with a high ceiling, 16 to 20 feet tall, and it's all open space an additional 500 square foot wood shop attached and we'll have solar. If it, um, what's our best option for heat? Yeah, I can, I can take this one. You know, that, that's great. I'm kind of jealous 1500 square foot shop. So it sounds like, sounds like fun. Um, I would be looking at some heat pumps, some, some, some mini splits. Um, you know, they usually work, let's say, you know, per ton you're looking at, I don't know, like five, 600, square feet, let's say. Um, but the efficiency, you get some really good efficient ones. You can either have, 
multiple head units, like in that shop setting. Um, and, you know, with that combined with the solar, um, you know, the, the way that the heat pump works, it's kind of got to wave the way the load works. So you can kind of keep that going, you know, that, that warm air just circulating through there um, all the way down to, you know, obviously whatever temperature if you want to do minus 25, minus 15, minus five. Um, and then also I'd look into some, uh, you know, some ceiling fans possibly in there with those high ceilings kind of circulating the heat in there. Um, and it all depends on, you know, what you, what you like. Um, I see a lot of people put in, you know, obviously in floor heating, if you have a big slab, you know, once before you pour it, you know, you can get the tubing in there. Um, so you can look at some different options there. Um, so I've, I've seen some people use some just straight up, uh, you know, water heaters basically. And, and you, you have that set up on a timer controlling, um, some circulating pumps and, uh, it's just constantly heating that slab up to a certain temperature because, you know, you kind of shop setting, do you want it 70 degrees or do you want it 60? Um, is it something, <clears throat> whatever you're going to have in there, um, you know, climate control wise, uh, you know, and being comfortable working and stuff. So, um, again, I definitely just, uh, re please reach out to us. It'd be a great project to work with you on. Great. Yep. Um, I'm, planning to make changes to our home's heating for the winter season, possibly in 2022 or 2023. How can I find out if any of LPA's rebates are changing? Yeah, you'll, you'll start to see communications um, from us going into the end of the year here for upcoming changes. Um, we plan to have some, but they're hopefully going to be small. Um, we will start to, to talk about those kind of heading into December. Um, just to make sure that you know, our entire membership kind of knows what's going on. And then you'll see going into 2022, um, you know, what we're able to, to come up with there. So we'll, we'll try and give you as much lead time as we can on the, on the changes on those things. But yeah, certainly if you have specific questions, if you're planning to submit a rebate soon on a, on a larger project, um, you know, let us know, get in touch with us. And uh, that way we can kind of get it on the radar and start working with you early. Yeah, and everything will be posted to our web website as well. Just keep an eye out there. Um, have you heard of or know anything about the Chill Tricks, Chill Tricks brand air to water heat pump? If so, what do you know? What are your thoughts? Yeah, we're we're, we're familiar, right, John? Um, I can take a maybe a stab at the first part of it. Um, yeah, you know, so you're obviously you know. In floor, I, I'm suspecting um, uh, hydronic uh, with a heat pump. Um, my suggestion is to watch the, you know, the efficiency ratings on the Childrix. Um, I know they probably have gotten a lot better. Uh, we do have one that it was locally that, you know, a few years ago um, we were kind of involved with. Um, and and I, that's all I can really say is just, you know, look at those those SEER ratings, uh, the HSPF ratings, and try to get um, something with the highest rating, like that's a, that's a cold climate, basically. So. Yeah, there, there are there are so many options out there for heat pumps now, and I, I'm not sure which way the industry is going to head, whether it consolidates or not. A lot of the brands are owned by essentially the same companies, um, just kind of under different brand names. Um, so yeah, I would say do, do some shopping, Check out some reviews, um, you know, get, get some references for, for existing systems that are out there. Um, and like that's saying is, you know, shop it out a bit and make sure the ratings are where they need to be. Um, but yeah, a lot, lot of options out there that you don't need to, you need to um, kind of settle on any, any, any single, single brand manufacturer there. Yeah. And just to chime in on the chill trick specifically, um, I would say if you do decide to go with that brand, talk to your contractor here and be sure they have familiarity. Um, the person that I, I'm aware of here done in the past does have a great working heat pump now, um, but I believe he did have to go through like two contractors to get that done. So with that brand specifically, it would be, it just definitely be worth making sure that that's something they're familiar with since a lot of them do have a preferred model um, that they go with. It's Dominic May, our uh, architect for our DER, DER programs, a uh, ton of experience working on them. Um, yeah, a lot of these, a lot of these systems. So, um, Emily, you have a couple more for us. Oh, great! You know, we're right at time. 
Um, I have one last question up here. If you could quickly explain um, the difference between air source, air to water, and a ground source heat pump. Um, and I think that is our last question for the day. Sure. Um, yeah, I'll jump on this one. So, so the the kind of split there. So air to air is going to be our our source, and then where it's going. Um, so we've got a couple options on the source. So we can pull heat from the air. We can pull it from the ground, which is earth, or we can actually have water loops too. So if you have a, a pond or a lake or anything like that um, near your near your home, you can actually bury a loop inside of uh, water. And then the two portion of that is going to be air. So um, most of what we've seen today is is the is going to be the two air portion. So it's going through an air handler. It's going through a mini split. Um, it's going through that duct that, that compact ductless system. Um, whereas water, um, so two water is going to be our in-floor hydronic systems, or uh, you, know, you might have um, some radiators or things like that, where um, you have a water loop going through there, glycol loop, uh, loop going through there. Um, so that's going to be the, the split there. So air to air is grab it from the air, pass it back into the home through the air. Um, yeah, air to, air to water would be grab it from the air, put it into a hydronic loop in the floor. And pass it through that way. Ground to air would be pull that heat up out of the earth and pass it into the air in the home. Or if you've got ground to water, even you can pull it from the ground and pass it into a hydronic loop in the home. Um, so yeah, that's the split between those. A lot of options out there, just based on kind of what you have available around around your property. Awesome. Well, thank you guys. Big round of applause for Dennis and John. Um, thank you guys so much for a great presentation, and thank you all for attending. Um, as always, you have great questions. We love engaging with our membership. Please don't hesitate to reach out to us anytime for your home heating options or any of energy efficiency related projects in your home or business. Um, we have four energy management advisors here to help as well as a great team behind us too. Um, Dennis and John's contact info is on the screen and rebates at lpea.coop is always a great place to reach us. Thank you guys so much for being here and have a great evening.